Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express for news and views with an API point of view. We are hosts today, Preeti Mangla Shekhar and Hanjoy Barbora. Keep it locked right here at Apex Express. We begin today's show spotlighting South Korea. Stay tuned to find out about an urgent issue impacting the, a tiny island in this part of the world called Jeju Island. Apex Express's Preeti Shekhar sits down in conversation with Christine Ang, Executive Director of the Korea Policy Institute, about the grave human rights and environmental crisis facing this tiny island and how you can do something to be a part of the growing global resistance. This is Preeti Mangla Shekhar for Apex Express. I have with me on air uh, Christine Ahn, who is the Executive Director of the Korea Policy Institute and an Advisory Committee member of the Global Campaign to Save Jeju Island. Christine is here to tell us about the construction of a naval base that's happening uh, by the South Korean government, um, a, a base on Jeju Island, officially named the Island of World Peace by the late President Ro Mu Hyun. Jeju was the site of a 1948 massacre in which more than 30,000 civilians were estimated to have been slaughtered during a democratic uprising. It's located strategically in the Korean Strait and the island's potential to become a military target in the event of an armed conflict in this tense region would increase exponentially with the addition of a naval base. Since plans for the naval base were announced five years ago, 94% of Ganjong residents have voted against the base and used every possible democratic means to block its construction in their pristine fishing village. Yet their protests have fallen on mostly deaf ears. Jeju Island is situated off the southern part of the Korean Peninsula and covers a lava plateau with a shield volcano at an elevation of 1950 meters above sea level. The high biological diversity, unique volcanic topography and the culture of the island attracts many tourists. So here to tell us more about the situation on the ground is Christine Ahn. Christine, welcome to Apex Express. Thank you, PT. So you were there earlier this summer. Um, you visited the island as part of your work um, with the Korea Policy Institute. Tell us about the situation on the ground and what you saw there. Um, well, I actually went at the end of summer, at the end of July, early August, and um, it was at a very high point in the resistance. Um, more and more people had come to visit their village. They had actually transformed um, the coastline, which is where the base is to be built. Um, they had built this incredible art uh, art park um, with structures, peace structures, um, beautiful murals, and, um, you know, they had this sort of, um, you know, com uh, communication center where there were, you know, tables with people sitting behind laptops and just kind of updating, you know, whether it was communicating to Taiwan, to the mainland, to Japan, to the U.S., um, really regular communication between the villagers um, and activists that were there to support them with also the global peace community. So I was there at a high point. Um, unfortunately, what has since um, turned is uh, a severe crackdown against this beautiful, inspiring, and courageous resistance by the South Korean government and the police. Um, weeks after I had left, they uh, arrested um, the village mayor his name is um, Mayor Kang, and he was born and raised in the village. And, um, you know, the various tactics that governments or nation states deploy to really kind of quash any kind of uprising. And um, since then, they have arrested, you know, some very central activists that have been supporting the struggle and other villagers and um 
you know, there was a major showdown where the South Korean central government sent um, a thousand armed riot police um, who then, you know, was in a, like confrontation with there were hundreds of activists that were visiting um, that village in support and solidarity and um, then arrested like 35 activists then. So things have gotten very, very bad. And um, in fact, they sealed off when I was there, they had erected almost a 30-foot wall. I mean, in some ways, I had never been to Gaza or to Palestine, and this was the feeling that I had. This is what the wall is doing. It is dividing the people from access to the land, to their natural resources, and um, I was able, I had, had access to go through that wall to, because there was this main agricultural road which the farmers had used to access the coastline. And um, by the time that the right police came, they had um, essentially sealed off all access. And since those arrests, since that crackdown, um, the Navy has been moving full steam ahead, you know, with their military contractor, Samsung, Day Lim, um, Hyundai is also part of this to um, start to, you know, drill at this um, beautiful coastline, which, you know, is a UNESCO designated preservation site and um, is just drilling into the heart of the villagers. So it's a really critical time that actually people know about this resistance and that people can get active and involved. The thing is, it's so tricky because, um, you know, there's this question of, well, whose base is it? And, um, you know, the, there's just, there's too many of these sort of um, signs that uh, many of us have received. For one, um, earlier this spring, when we learned of the resistance, um, several of us in the U.S., Americans, called the South Korean Embassy to register our complaints. And I was one of them that called. And in fact, what I, the response I got was very surprising. The, um, the people that answered the phone said, you know, don't be calling us. You should be calling the State Department or the Defense Department because they're the ones pressuring us to build the space. And in another case, somebody said, this is a U.S. base. Mm-hmm. So that was very interesting. And then another um, is there was an uh, op-ed in the Huffington Post by a former senator who said the Obama administration is building a base with uh, in South Korea on Jeju Island. And then the other thing that is probably the hardest evidence we have is that South Korea has agreed to dock 20 warships. And uh, among the warships are two Aegis destroyers. And, you know, for many of us that don't really understand the kind of hard-nosed technology of, of warfare, this Aegis destroyer is a very expensive piece of machinery. It's a, it's a warship. But what makes it so expensive is that it has a, a very high-tech technology that is connected to the U.S. satellite system, the so-called U.S. missile defense system. So that really is the thing that really is um, bringing it to the fore. Whose base is this? And if it really is intended to connect to the U.S. missile defense system, is it then being built for the purpose of U.S. in its strategy to contain China? How has the media covered it both in Korea and here? Well, I would say that it took a while for the villagers to get um, international or even domestic media attention. But I would say that um, at the end of summer, and still now, it's still trickling in, but there was definitely a moment where uh, the media was covering it more. I mean, the unfortunate thing is that because the Korean War has not ended on the Korean Peninsula, that the Cold War still affects so much of the mindset. And so it's so easy to cast, and which the a lot of the mainstream and conservative media has done is to cast the villagers as, and you know, these are ordinary fishermen, um, farmers, I mean, citrus growers, uh, these elderly women sea divers, they're casting them as communists, you know, mm-hmm. as pro-North Korean sympathizers, when in fact that's the farthest truth 
you know. Mm-hmm. Um, these are just ordinary people that are fighting for their community. They're fighting for access to their land, to their coastline, to their, you know, ancient village, which is this precious ecological zone where fresh spring water meets the ocean. I mean, where on earth does that happen? And in fact, on this island, which, you know, has a very, very tragic history, which witnessed a massacre in 1948 preceding the Korean War, which the U.S. oversaw this massacre. And, um, you know, and for years when uh, Korea was under Japanese occupation, this village was one of the only places on the entire island that could grow and produce rice. And so now you're going to build, pour concrete over this beautiful coastline and destroy the the land of these these people, these uh, mostly now elderly uh, villagers. What is so disgusting is the kind of propaganda that the South Korean government has been issuing, saying that, oh, this was the result of a very democratic process, when in fact, that is the farthest from it. And that was one thing that I learned when I was there. I just was kind of piecing together the various stories that I heard from the villagers, and I was just stunned to learn the process by which the Navy, the South Korean government and the Navy, colluded to essentially have that village be the site of the naval base. I mean, just as an example, they held a vote by clapping. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And there's 1,050 registered voters in that village. And of the, there were 87 people that had shown up for this so-called vote. So the whole process has been very, very undemocratic and very corrupt. And so you can imagine the villagers saying even more that um, this is a very unjust and illegal process. And as they fight to try to um, you know, um, fight against through democratic and legal means. It just shows that sometimes uh, the system is against you. And so that has what led them to use their bodies, mm-hmm. you know, to try to resist. Yeah. And already the force is so strong. So mm-hmm. that this is where they really need international support. They need the global solidarity. And that's why it's so crucial to to get their stories on the air like this. Right. And then speaking about the global galvanizing, I was wondering if you are also an advisory committee member of the global campaign to save Jeju Island. Could you speak a little bit more about how this campaign has come about and how it has gained some global um, uh, you know, solidarity and how listeners can also be a part of this solidarity? Absolutely. Well, it just started because, um, you know, we felt the in communication with several of the villagers and some of the activists who have been working with them that, you know, they had been fighting and resisting and they weren't getting the kind of global attention. And sometimes in Korea, because it is um, a country that, you know, has experienced a kind of colonization and it's still, you know, under U.S. military occupation, um, you know, there is a way in which um, having the presence of the white people or Americans or international people, Westerners, can actually bring visibility to a struggle. So I would say that the global attention that some of us were able to give, I was able to publish an op-ed in the New York Times. Gloria Steinem published um, an op-ed in the Sunday Times two days after I did. Um, I think that really helped pry open the door. Mm-hmm. And so um, we started a, a, a petition on one of the move on sites, signon.org. We gathered um, almost 6,000 signatures that were sent to the South Korean president, Lee Myung Park. And um, we've just been, you know, serving as a connector, uh, sort of a megaphone for the villagers. Um, you know, I think Noam Chomsky has just published an op-ed about the villagers, and, you know, we're doing what we can. We're providing financial support to the villagers when they need, and, um, you know, sending delegations. In fact, you know, um, one of my close colleagues is Gwen Kirk. She's a longtime feminist, anti-military scholar, and they just published, or they just produced this film called Living Along the Fence Line, which is the stories of, of women living in seven, seven different places, all fighting against a militarism and U.S. militarism. And um, I just felt like it was a really great opportunity to show that film on Jeju Island. 
and they just had the Jeju Women's Film Festival, and this was um, the key film that they were shown. And Gwen actually went to Korea. She was actually at the film festival last week, and, you know, it just sparking the conversation about what does security mean and do we really need to have more military bases? Do we really need to have more weapons of mass destruction at a time when the global um, world is facing massive economic crisis, when we can't even meet the basic human security of people's needs? So, um, you know, we're doing what we can, and the website is called savejejuisland.org, and there's tremendous resources there. If people can donate um, any small amount to support the struggle, uh, to support the villagers, you know, they're being fined um, heavily for um, their so-called, you know, blocking construction or blocking business, obstructing business, that's what they're calling it. So um, we need to let, let them know that, you know, we're, we're in solidarity with them. But also, we need to do what we can here in the United States to put pressure on our government because what we know is that from the experience of so many of the activists, whether it's in Okinawa, whether it's in Guam, whether it's in the Philippines, um, that the people of those countries are fed up with U.S. military bases. I mean, just the other day, a, a South Korean teenager was raped by a U.S. soldier. And, you know, it has just gone on for far too long. So that's the kind of security that our military is providing for the people of those countries. Meanwhile, we are suffering tremendously here in this country because of an over-bloated defense budget. And so I think that, um, you know, the two sides are aligning. There is greater connection now, more than ever, to kind of mobilize and make demands of our of our members of Congress, of our president. Uh, we have an election year uh, coming up, and it's an opportunity for us to engage in the political and electoral process to let our officials and potential uh, future representatives know that we can't continue to go on like this. It's not good for our human security in this country, and it's not not good for the security of those people in which our bases are located. Thank you so much, Christine, for your insights and analysis. And I hope our listeners will, you know, really walk away with understanding that uh, peace and security issues is an environmental issue. It's a feminist issue. It's a human rights issue. It's just, uh, I think ignoring it has just been really, really logical in every which way. So thank you for showing that. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Preeti. You just heard a discussion with Christine Ahn from the Korea po Policy Institute on the grave environmental and human rights crisis facing Jeju Islands in South Korea. Please visit their website, savejejuisland.org, to be a part of the resistance. September 25th was the 100th birth anniversary of the renowned Pakistani poet and humanist Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Last Sunday, the Berkeley Urdu and Pakistan Initiative hosted Guftagu, an event to commemorate the occasion. Fez was closely associated with the Progressive Writers Association, an anti-imperialist body that promoted secular socialist thought in pre-partition British India. He was also a distinguished journalist who edited several Urdu and English dailies and weeklies in Pakistan. However, generations of South Asians remember Faiz Ahmed Faiz for his searing verses that spoke of the trials and tribulations of ordinary working people. He wrote of love and passion, not as simple emotions, but as deeply ingrained political choices that impacted the lives of people. It is indeed a tribute to his humanism that despite deep-rooted political divisions and conflicts, he is still accepted as a standard bearer of progressive literature and culture across South Asia. His poem, Dasht e Tanhai, or Remembrance, speaks of the comfort of love and memory and was rendered in song at this event by Anupama Chandratreya. <laughs> Yeah. 
this event, Apex Express's Hanjay Barbora spoke to Professor Saba Mahmood from the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at UC Berkeley at this event. Here are some excerpts. How did Fez's political views influence his cultural work? Well, in a sense, all of Fez's uh, poetry um, is suffused with his politics. So his love of the people, the common man, the, the, the people who society has overlooked, that the, those who have been left aside uh, in pursuit of wealth and power. There's that dimension to his poetry. Then there is another dimension to his poetry, which was his severe and unrelenting resistance to all the various uh, dictators that have come and gone um, in, in Pakistan. And so he often, for example, would talk about the beloved and, and love in metaphors that were also for love of the common man and love of, for his country, which he saw not as just supporting the rulers, but as truly supporting the spirit of the people who, who lived in that nation. And so he would often use Sufi metaphors, metaphors of, of ishq, of love, of the beloved, in in order to talk about these things. So there was hardly any kind of poetry that he wrote that did not involve uh, his politics. Which brings me to a corollary question. I mean, Fez is revealed across South Asia. Yes. How is he viewed within Pakistan where the state would not necessarily like to engage with the kind of politics that he espoused? Um, and, and similarly, what are the challenges of teaching, teaching Fez or the generation who grew up after he died yes. engage with his work and his politics? Well, you know, this is just an amazing um, uh, question because the power of Fez's poetry is that it reached people despite all forms of censorship that various governments, whether it was the government of Ayub Khan, then, of course, later on, Ziaul Haq, he was in exile for a lot, long period of time. He was, of course, jailed for his um, criticisms of Ayub Khan. Yet, it's his, his, the power of his poetry reached not just the elite in the country, and this is what is so beautiful about it, is that it reached the common person. Now, this has to do with the fact that there is already a tradition in South Asia of poetry recitation. So one doesn't have to be literate li uh, or be able to read in order to know poetry or to recite poetry. In that sense, poetry in South Asian culture has a very different role than, let's say, in European countries, where uh, it's the literate, it's the um, common, uh, it's, it's the literate people who know high poetry, poetry, you know, or, or literature such as that of Shakespeare or Coleridge and so on. But as you know very well, somebody like Ghalib, who was of course a, a court uh, poet, you could go in a bazaar and you could be buying, uh, you know, a, a bag full of mangoes and the person will turn around and recite a couplet verbatim from Ghalib's poem without necessarily uh, being tutored in schools or necessarily ha even having the capacity to read or being literate. And the same is, that is why Fez's poetry was able to travel. It had a message. It was, uh, it was very beautifully evocative of what Pakistan was going through in its various moments. And people could connect to it. Um, you know, what's interesting is that, of course, uh, the same applies to today's generation um, as it applied to the the generation that was alive uh, that was alive in, in the time of Fez. Even though he was exiled, he was jailed, his poetry continued to live on. And I think what you saw in today's event, which is so interesting to see, is that poet Fez's poetry is being revived through artists. And these are of course artists not just living in Pakistan but outside of Pakistan in India and so on. And they they're extending his 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 uh, poetry beyond um, just the reading and recitation of it and taking it into various forms of art. So that's one way in which it is reliving. Uh, again, then this brings me again to a question. Then how does, where does
does one find Fez's views reflected in his leftist, uh, his leftist views, let's say, uh, in Pakistani politics today? Well, you know, um, Fez is not just a poet of the left. He's, of course, that too. But, you know, what's so amazing about Fez's poems is that even people who are not necessarily leftist per se can be moved by them because it speaks to a fundamental kind of justice and yet it also has metaphors that it uses of you know standing tropes of Urdu poetry, Urdu shairi it uses metaphors of Sufism, it, even um, for example Hum Dekhenge, you know the So he is. That's why his poetry speaks to people. So I'll just end off with the last question. What has been the trajectory of the Communist Party of Pakistan since then, and what has been Fez's? How has Fez influenced this trajectory? Well, you know, Fez, of course, uh, was, um, um, if not a formal, but certainly informal member of the of Communist Party. Communist Party was banned very early on in Pakistan. Of course, its ultimate demise came. Uh, during the Ziaul Haq period. So, for example, when I was growing up and I was a student at Natural College of Arts where Fez's daughter teaches or taught for 33 years, where Fez himself was on the board of directors, that there were, uh, during those student days, there was sort of cultural wing of the, of the, of the Communist Party that was functional. For example, I used to be a part of a street theater group that would do street, we didn't know we were part of the Communist Party, but we were educated in that literature and that culture by virtue of participating in that in those kinds of you know cultural activities. So I came to know Fez through those kinds of activities, through student politics, through doing uh, mushairas. But at times, uh, I mean, uh, for example, we performed Brecht and and uh, uh, Gorky's theater, but it was all had elements of Fez's poetry in it. We would inject, and that's how my exposure to Fez came, even though, you know, I was going to college at the time and Ziaul Haq had just come into power. So there are all these other ways in which Fez's legacy has lived on. And what's interesting is it's a cultural way for people to come to that politics without necessarily recognizing that they're signing on to some kind of a, you know, communist agenda. So I think that's the beauty of it. Coming up next on this special on renowned Pakistani poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz is a musical rendition of the, of the poem Hum De Kenge or We Will See. This is one of Faiz's best known poems that has been rendered into song and sung at protests, rallies and demonstrations across South Asia. The summarized English translation of the poem goes thus. We shall live to see, so it is writ, we shall live to see, the day that has been promised, the day that has been ordained. The day when mountains of oppression will blow away like wisps of cotton, when the earth will dance beneath the feet of the once enslaved, and heavens will shake with thunder over the heads of tyrants, and the idols in the house of God will be thrown out. We, the rejects of the earth, will be raised to a place of honor. All crowns will be tossed in the air, all thrones will be smashed. <laughs> Ooh. Mm-hmm. 
Musical rendition of another famous poem by Faiz Ahmed Faiz titled "Mujh Se Pehli Si Mohabbat Mere Mehboob Na Mang," which loosely translates to "Do not ask for that first love again." You're listening to Apex Express at ninety four point one FM and at kpfa dot org. Ticket giveaway: We are giving away two tickets for Cambodia's Khmer Arts Ensemble. Performing at the Zellerbach, Zellerbach Hall on Sunday, October second at three p.m. For those of you that missed out last week, be caller number one. The phone number to call is five one zero eight four eight four four two five. That's five one zero eight four eight four four two five. Ten years ago, time stood still for the people of New York. The attack on the World Trade Center left deep scars with people all over the world. Most of us remember vividly where we were and what we did on September 11th, 2001. The images of those two towers falling down are entrenched in our collective memories. However, when the dust cleared, we all continued to live our lives in a post-9/11 world. For some of us, that world has changed immensely, while others have moved on with ease. Tune into this Radio Netherlands's South Asia Wired special as they ask three people from South Asian from the South Asian subcontinent to share their views on the 9/11 terror attacks and how it changed their own country. The voices you'll be hearing are of Mayank Shekhar, a journalist and film critic from India, Humayun Khan, who's a research analyst and specializes in U.S.-Pakistan relations, and Rezwan, a blogger and NGO worker from Bangladesh. Was in Delhi. Uh, which is where uh, uh, I was doing my college, uh, and uh, when well, my brother happened to be in New York at the same time, that's where that's where he used to live, and uh, you know we were obviously worried for him. Uh, on that day, uh, I was at home, uh, which is uh, my, my parents' home, and of course, like everybody else in the world, uh, was following uh, the event. Uh, on television, how has 9/11 affected the film industry in India? Has it influenced it? I'm not absolutely certain uh, the impact of 9/11 per se on Indian films, but clearly terrorism uh, as an idea, given that it, events like these have been quite recurrent in India uh, even before 9/11. In fact, uh, the, the biggest thing that that happened uh, uh, in that sphere was the attack in Bombay in 1993, which kind of completely changed the dynamics of. Uh, Of, of crime in the country that completely changed things in terms of who the villain in in Bombay's films became, and they certainly became terrorists. But there, there have been quite a few films actually uh, which have looked into this uh, to a large extent. And there was Shah Rukh Khan's film, in fact, which was the biggest mainstream movie to to look at the issue of identity and being a Muslim and being uh, you know uh, being racially profiled for it, which was a movie called Mujahid Ali Khan. Uh, which is primarily about uh, Shah Rukh Khan, of course, played uh, the gentleman Khan Khan, who's uh, uh, you know who's mentally challenged um, to some extent, and then you know he goes uh, you know he goes looking for the U.S. president, and all he wants to tell him is that uh, his name is Khan, he's not a terrorist. That was example of a film uh, that was looking at the issue globally. Uh, a lot of Hindi films have looked at it from the point of. Uh, the impact of terrorism in India itself, which is to some extent much older than 9/11 for India. There have been two or three films which looked at, uh, uh, well, not two or three films. Actually, like one film, a uh, very interesting film called uh, Tere Bin Laden. Bin Laden, of course, being Osama Bin Laden, and Tere means your. Now that film was actually a, a, a black comedy, uh, you know, full of uh, dark humor, about this guy who. Uh, 
poses as uh, as Osama bin Laden, and he sends these tapes um, to various news channels um, as Osama, and you know he does this uh, to make uh, some money on the side. And I mean, you'll have to see the film to kind of figure the humor of it, uh, but uh, but very smartly done. So quite obviously, it's there in the consciousness of filmmakers. It's certainly uh, commented upon uh, and widely so. There are a couple of things that happened with 9/11 that Indians actually uh, take heart to. Suddenly, it's not just our problem, but it's a problem that has spread as an epidemic across. So, uh, the same terror groups they may have a they may have an issue with uh, with with Kashmir, but they also have an issue with the Middle East. They also have an issue with the Americans. They suddenly have an issue with with enough number of people outside India for everyone to see it as a global issue itself, and that needs to be dealt with. So. Uh, if if you ask me uh, what was the impact of 9/11 on indians and their personal lives or or the political life of india i think it was uh, more positive than negative from it being a, a just an indian problem uh, it really became a, a, a global issue and that that's something that we saw even with 2611 attacks in in bombay where you know the 10 places were attacked uh, the two hotels uh, you know oberoi and uh, and and you know and and taj where, where you know get were under siege and, and things like that. The kind of play that that news got across the world, I don't think would have been the case uh, if it if it weren't for now. The first uh, feeling which I got, oh bloody hell, something terrible happened. Everybody now says that Pakistanis were generally happy. Trust me, most of the people I met, my friends, colleagues, or people we spoke to that night, I didn't feel a single person saying it is a good thing. Which everybody is saying, bloody hell. We were very much ashamed that a Muslim could like kill civilians. That's really bad. So that was the first feeling which we had with most of the educated people we talked about. Did you realize in that moment already that this would have repercussions for Pakistan? I I didn't realize. I didn't foresee uh, there could be repercussions for our country. But the next few days, it turned out yes. There are repercussions for us as well. Over the past ten years, the ten years that followed, uh, Pakistan has been in the forefront of the war against terror. How has that yeah. changed Pakistan? You know, uh, I think uh, everything which has happened over the past ten years, specifically related to war and terror, and uh, after 9/11, we are now facing the worst terror or the repercussion or whatever name you can give it to. Because of 9/11, things have started going bad inside our country as well. There were no suicide attacks before 2001 or even before 2004, and slowly, since we became part of the war on terror and the most non-NATO ally and the country who is doing a lot in war on terror, uh, this Al Qaeda and Taliban associates they turned against us, and we are under the attack from them and. Not only that, our most trusted friend, United States, still believes that we are not doing enough. Um, are, are you a Muslim yourself? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Has it changed the way you looked at people around you, your own religion, or being a Muslim in Pakistan in this moment? Has it changed your personal world? It has really hurt me as a person, or me as a Muslim, that my religion. Has got a very bad name for a very small number of minute people who have been doing bad things. As a Pakistani, we were really in a very awkward position because if there is a small number of people who are doing something bad, why 180 million people are being accused of the same thing? So this perception of terrorism and its association with the Islam and the whole thing was a really bad thing for me. And the positive thing which has come out of this thing. Being a Muslim or being a Pakistani, I feel okay. Despite the fact that it's a bad thing, but let's say whatever it is now, it is the duty of that silent majority of all of us everywhere who are educated or who have, let's say, wisdom or knowledge of what is happening around, to duty to tell this small minority who is doing it wrong, uh, you should not be representing the whole Muslim world. And then again, we should be telling the Western civilization. That there's a difference between these people and us. Majority of us are not like that, and we would like to change this perception for whatever reason. This perception has been. Where were you when the towers came down in New York in 
I think I I was in home. Um, then someone called me and said that uh, please watch CNN. Something's happening. And then uh, I saw that you know the plane slamming the World Trade Center, and uh, and said oh I was, I was shocked by that. And after a while I went out to a mall, and actually uh, there was a. Uh, TV in uh, uh, in the open, and the people were just, I mean, uh, uh, were in disbelief. And uh, some said that probably it's it's from a movie or something, and they couldn't believe, believe it's act- actually happening. Do you yeah. remember what you thought while you saw it happening? Did you think it would affect Bangladesh? Did you think no, it would affect actually, your own life? Uh, we, we had no uh, actually we had no idea uh, what would follow. I mean, and uh, people were. We're not getting visa. For example, um, uh, one of my cousins was uh, due to fly in Canada, and he he just uh, didn't get his visa. In uh, our country, many people carry Muslim names, you know, Arabic names. For example, uh, someone had a same name with the, with a terrorist. Then it was very difficult to get clearance from the. I mean, it would take like if if they get, get, got the visa, it would take like uh, four to five months. In our country, uh, uh, in, in the next five years, uh, we, we saw many uh, the, the terrorist attacks in our country. So we, we had to add up uh, more, um, add up more security measures. For example, in malls, whenever you went to malls, and uh, you, you were searched, and uh, so these kind of uh, things actually affected us. I'm blogging since 2003, actually. Has it inspired you to be more opinionated about things? And blog? Yes, uh, I actually, yeah, when I started uh, my own blog, I mean, uh, it was uh, uh, because uh, then I saw that there there are negative ideas about our country. People didn't know much about Bangladesh, and they had only some ideas because only uh, the, the sad and uh, bad news travel fast and reach uh, the international community. For example, uh, we have uh, floods uh, or. For example, uh, political disturbance or terrorist attack, which is uh, reported by international media. But we have also many positive things, like uh, we have a, a popular society who uh, who loves culture, who loves their language and music. And uh, and uh, my uh, uh, effort was to highlight all those uh, issues to the world through your blog. Yeah. You've just heard a special edition of South Asia Wired from Radio Netherlands. The persons interviewed were Mayank Shekhar, Humayun Khan and Rezwan. And up next, the community calendar. On Friday, September 13th at 8pm, the Oakland Paramount Theatre presents Asha Bosley. Since making her soundtrack debut in 1948, Asha Bosley's stunning voice has been heard on more than 13,000 songs and featured in over 1,000 films in at least 15 different languages. Also performing with Asha Bosley at the SF Jazz is Nitin Shankar on percussion, music director and Ashish Khan on the sitar, Santosh Mulekar on the keyboard and Faisal Sureshi on the tabla. The performance takes place at 2025 Broadway in Oakland. For more information, visit sfjazz.org. On Sunday, October 16th at 2 p.m., the Berkeley Urdu and Pakistan Initiatives will present a discussion on contemporary art in Pakistan by the artist Naiza Khan and art historian Iftikhar Dadi. The discussion takes place at the Berkeley Arts Museum, 2626 Bancroft Way in Berkeley. And before we wrap up, we have a ticket giveaway that was announced earlier for lo- for listeners who may have missed it. We're giving away two tickets for Cambodia's Khmer Arts Ensemble performing at the Zellerbach Hall on Sunday, o- October 2nd at 3 p.m. Uh, callers number one should call 510-848-4425. And that's it for our show. Tune in next week to Apex Express at 7 p.m. right here on KPFA 94.1 FM. For more, do- for more details on the community calendar or to find archived shows, please visit our website apexexpress.org. If you have any questions or topics for future shows and feedback, please shoot us an email at apex at kpfa.org. 
और कॉल अस एट फाइव वन जीरो एट फोर एट सिक्स सेवन सिक्स सेवन एक्सटेंशन फोर सिक्स फोर विद जेन चैंग होल्डिंग डाउन द कंट्रोल्स वी बीन योर होस्ट प्रीति मंगला शेखर एंड हंजॉय बोरबोरा थैंक्स फॉर जॉइनिंग एस टनाइट ऑन एपेक्स एक्सप्रेस